think that there's three types of kids out there. I think there's the bully, I think there's the bystander, and I think there's the bullied. And the one thing I often ask parents is, well, which is your kid? Welcome to the Focus on the Family broadcast, helping families thrive. Jonathan, welcome back to Focus. Wow, thanks for having me again. We have cracked the can open on this discussion last time. Let me mention to the listeners, if you missed it, um, get it. Just call us or, you know, however we can get it to you, we will do that. But I think it was a great opening discussion about what parents can do to help their children to be aware, things to say, things not to say that could make it worse. So I appreciate that opening. You also mentioned, as I just stated, your experience being bullied, but that wasn't the end of that story and we didn't finish it because I wanted to pick up on day two and continue that into uh, high school and some of the things that took place. So let's pick the story up there and describe for us how that bullying continued uh, in later years. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because a lot of young people, they'll start going to school with a certain group of kids. And for me, that's what happened is a lot of kids uh, who had made fun of me for years, I got the braces, kind of got that stuff fixed. But another thing happened, and that was that it does something to you socially. And this is an awkward subject that not a lot of people talk about, but because I got some experience in it, um, I was, you know, I, I just was honest. And I honestly became a little more difficult. I became a little more oversensitive. I, when I saw people talking, thought, are they talking about me? And so I think it made me uh, a little more socially awkward. And as I went into middle school years, middle school years were the toughest, and I didn't have buck teeth. Um, but there was a group of kids who had always made fun of me. I assumed they were still making fun of me, but it made things worse because of the way I reacted. I didn't really know how to respond to it. And so it got to the point where... I mean, there wasn't a day that went by that books weren't being knocked off my desk. Mm. Um, the whole class, I mean, the whole class laughing at me. Um, and I think the pinnacle was probably in eighth grade. There was a group of boys um, who decided that they wanted to start what was they called the, and I'm not making this up, the Kill John Club. And they made T-shirts. Um, and they did the initials KJC because they couldn't have the word kill in their t-shirts because teachers would know whatever, but they would come to school with a t-shirt and it was this caricature of my face um, with, believe it or not, enormous teeth, even though my teeth weren't enormous anymore. And it had a gun scope on my face and it had the initials KJC. And so Mm. I'd, you know, go through the hallways and people would be like KJC. And uh, of course it was all under the radar. And and I actually told the teacher about it and I said, and they made t-shirts and the teacher said to me, no, they didn't. You know, that was it. That was the response. No, they didn't. And and as I interviewed, why why other, would they say that? I yeah, mean, yeah. And, that, and but here's the interesting thing. I'm not alone. Yeah. As I interviewed other people, very often uh, the stories I kept hearing. This isn't just per- perception. As they told the yard duty person, you know, as they told the certain. Te- and trust me, I know tons of great teachers and principals. I'm not saying all schools are like this. There's almost a denial that takes place. And let me tell you, as a parent, when my son was being bullied, and I shared a little bit about this in yesterday's broadcast, um, what I didn't share is I went to the principal. And as many wonderful principals as I know, this was not one of them. And as I sat down in her office and I shared specific details, here's what happened, here's what kids said to my son, Uh, here's what happened at recess the other day, here's what this kid did, she literally what kind of almost like shook her head as if like she hadn't heard a thing. And she goes, let me show you a few things. And she took us on a tour of the school, showed us every poster that said bully free zone. She showed us this banner in the cafeteria that said, our school is bully free as it's meant to be. So for her, that was sufficient. And she was showing us, I assure you, there's not bullying here at the school. Wow, that would have disconnected. She didn't hear a word. Hmm. and, And I tell you, there's a lot of parents out there that have this kind of frustration. They don't feel heard on this issue. And granted, some of us, we're freaking out. We're not approaching the situation well. But this happens every once in a while with where, administration. Where was your faith at this time? You're, you're mm-hmm. a young boy. I'm not sure of your parents' uh, you know, faith expression, if they're Christian, if it's yeah. a Christian home. Give me that element. And how are you, if you were uh, a Christian, how are you finding any hope? 
Well, let me tell you something. It, it was my saving grace because uh, as you mentioned yesterday and as I share in the book, there was a time I was standing on the edge of this bluff by my house and I was looking down and I really couldn't find much of a reason not to jump hmm. except that I actually went up there with a friend of mine and I looked at him and I said, I said, should I jump? Well, this friend was a friend I had from church. The saving grace I had was even though school was a nightmare for me every day, I was plugged into a loving church with a bunch of loving people where I went around and I was, you know, uh, liked, noticed, um, heard positive words, had friends that actually, you know, so school was tough, but if I could make it through that day and then I hung with my church friends that were actually affirming to me. And so, yeah, no, it was neat because God's gift of fellowship, other people that could affirm me in who I was in Christ, yeah. that it wasn't just how good looking you are, or how athletic you were, because I wasn't any of those things, right. you know? And so, yeah, man, I tell you, if I hadn't had that, the ending of the story probably would have been a lot different. Let, let's fill in those blanks because not everybody is bullied. And I can only remember a couple of occasions that that, that happened to me. And I thank the Lord for that. But you need, I think, to paint that picture for us. Standing on the bluff, what are the emotions that you're feeling? Like I'm not worthy enough, that I'm freakish, that I'm... What, how do you, with this continual, unrelenting kill John club, I mean, that had to be the ultimate of, why are people denigrating me? Why do I mean nothing to people? Why does my hmm. life not count? I mean, how do you resolve that as a young, you know, 13, 14-year-old? No, fantastic question. And I think the one word that sums up how I probably felt was alone. And as I interviewed other people, I kept hearing it again and again. Nobody understands. Nobody knows what it's like to be me. And there's this desire for people to understand you. There's a desire for one friend. And that's where, I tell you, my message as a kid who went through this, when I go to school assemblies and I talk to the, you know, a, a crowd of young people where I know I'm talking to the majority of bystanders and then a few bullies and some who are really being harassed, some who are bullied. And as I talk with them, the message I bring to them is you can make a difference in a kid's life. You can make a difference because every study out there shows that if you have just one friend, some studies will even use the word one close confidant, someone who you can talk with, that one friend can make the difference in that spiral downhill towards nothingness because when you feel alone, that is the, that is the one thing nobody understands me that seems to push kids past that tipping Which point. is also an opportunity for parents to fill that void as much as possible. By empathizing, listening, Correct. I'm so glad you told me. Well, let's, let's turn our attitude from the bullied to the bullies. Oftentimes, they're dealing with their own issues. There's probably a confluence of things that occur in this person's sure. life. But what does a bully look like? And what are some of those signs that parents, we need to you know, pay attention to, to identify that our kid might be the bully? Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's, that's one of those things where we need to possibly look. And, and, and of course, most of us as parents are going to say, well, not my kid. My well, kid it's never our do, kid. Yeah, yeah. Right. My kid wouldn't do that. But we could start looking for some of these signs. And sometimes the signs are a little different between girls and guys. Girls tend to get a little more into the drama and the social power plays um, where they'll ostracize someone from their group. You know, we aren't talking with Jenny anymore, you know, or whatever that is. Um, you know, you know, hey, oh, there's Brianna. Pretend you don't know her, you know. And there's some of those kind of, where guys tend to be a little more physical, slapping the back of the neck, you know, the that Bigger guys stuff. picking yeah, on yeah, yeah, exactly. littler guys. It's a size thing very often. Um, but, I mean, th those are just kind of rules of thumb. It, it happens. There's plenty of girls who get physical and plenty of guys who, you know, play those same kind of games. But we as parents, one of the things we need to kind of look for some of those signs. One of the big signs is low self-esteem in our kids because if our kids themselves don't feel good about themselves, what they want to do is they want to raise themselves up mm -hmm. and make themselves feel better by making fun of others. Um, so sometimes it comes out if you start to see this self-centeredness, um, along with another huge sign would be lack of empathy. And we keep using the word empathy. We used it yesterday on the show several different times because empathy is the you know, ability to step in someone else's shoes and identify with them and, and identify with their hurt. And, 
And sadly, we're living in a world where um, because of the inundation of entertainment media that doesn't show a lot of empathy, that's that's kind of quick to ridicule, even a lot of, you know, a lot of gaming situations, we're kind of losing our empathy for those social media where we're staring at screens instead of even looking at facial expressions and, and what are they thinking, what are, you know, we're just kind of what's right there on the screen. So there's a growing lack of empathy already in our culture, but... Um, if we start to see out of our kid these behaviors where maybe we even see these angry outbursts, them taking it out on other people, um, even as our kids are playing, if we see them constantly controlling, no, you do this, you do this, and if we see some of that narcissistic behavior, sometimes if you add up all those different signs, it might mean that, hey, uh, we should maybe step in and talk with our kids about empathy. Start, start, um, you know, you, you know, sharing some of these stories as we read it in the paper. If we read a story in this book, hey, let me read this story, you know, what do you, and start helping our kids and start modeling empathy um, so that we can mm. start talking about what it's like to step yeah. in another kid's shoes. Mm. Hey, Jonathan, in your book, and I, I hope I'm not sharing anything I shouldn't, but you mentioned your daughters. Uh, one of your daughters looked back at her early years and admitted that she was the mean one. And I think her description is really where I want to spend a couple of minutes here because she said, honestly, once I got with the popular kids and I was in, it was normal to laugh at those who weren't. Hmm. That to me is one of the biggest issues is if you fall into the group of the popular kids, there's kind of group think that begins to occur and they move in a herd, if I can use that term, to where you laugh at the same things, you ridicule hmm. the same things because you want to maintain your status as being in. Is that a fair description, A? And then B, again, how does a parent talk to their kids about being with the most popular kids isn't necessarily the goal for you as a Christian. Yeah. What you have to look at is this. Fill mm -hmm. in those blanks. Well, right now, our culture is pushing so much towards you know, status and popularity. Um, we're seeing a cultural shift in this. Um, in our Instagram culture where, you know, hey, look at me, uh, you know, I hope I do, I hope I'm liked in this post. Um, we're starting to see fame as a value. There was a recent study um, where they asked kids, what's your number one value? And fame literally just got up to number one where it used to be down like number 14 or 17. Yeah. It's now number one. And so, I'd say fame at all cost, even if it's negative fame. Yeah. Even if it means, you know, at the expense of others. And so for a kid who's finally got people liking them, accepting them, looking up to them, that's, a, that's really tough to say, no, you shouldn't be there. You know, I mean, so, so this is a huge temptation. And if it means at the expense of others, I mean, that's where obviously it becomes a problem if it means I have to laugh at others. So again, here's where we as parents can not only model this, but raise awareness about this. That's why I like to tell these stories. When I do school assemblies, I constantly am telling stories. Um, the novel I wrote, uh, you know, uh, about this, about what it's like to be a bystander. I want to raise awareness so that young people step outside of their shoes, hear these stories of what it's like to be, because I'm pretty sure that the guy I talked, you know, had a conversation with and interviewed for this book who, you know, was the big football player guy who was overweight and all his buddies would make, you know, kind of make fun of his belly in a good way. I think if a lot of them really knew yes. what was going on in his head, I think some of those guys wouldn't have, wouldn't have wanted to do that. And uh, that, that would be true. I think male humor uh, is, is a little cutting in that way. Sure. It, we think we're having fun with each other and that I, I could take it as well as give it. Yeah. But there are sensitive... Oh, I'm just playing? Right. There's sensitive spirits, especially if you have some issues, if you're overweight or, yeah. you know, even in your case where your, your buck teeth uh, w was the sure. big issue when people looked at you, this is what they teased well, you about. And, and we as moms and dads need to be so proactive mm -hmm. about engaging in these dialogues. Um, when I talk to uh, kids at church or at camps, the scripture passage I often go to is Philippians 2, because that's that passage where it talks about us not thinking about ourselves, but mm -hmm. considering others better than ourselves. And I always ask kids, I go, what's that look like in your world? 
What's that look like to, to not think about, you know, you know, and we naturally do that. I mean, think about that. From when we were kids, we, you know, the piece of cake, you know, gets up there, there's two pieces of cake, you and your brother. I mean, what are you going to do? You know, oh, here, you have the big piece, you well, know? it depends on how good the cake is. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it does. It does. You go, you, ugh, you eat this. <laughs> oh, and, well, and, and my friend Matt Furby works with junior high kids, and he says, you know, I've never walked to the car with a bunch of junior high boys, and he goes, it, without, without this happening, he goes, every time you're in sight of the car, what does every junior high boy yell out? Shot, 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 shot gun. He goes, he goes, absolutely. He goes, why? We want to be in that front seat. We want to, he goes, I've never heard a kid go shotgun for you, you know, to his friend, <laughs> you know? And I love that. And Matt's hilarious. The, and, the competitiveness yeah, is building. And, and yeah. it's amazing. If we could teach our kids shotgun for you, you know, teach them to consider others giving. better than themselves. Yeah, giving. And a lot of that is raising empathy, stepping in other people's shoes. And you know yeah. what? Um, a lot of our kids really do care if they take the time to do that and we need to help yeah. our kids with that well and that that is a great point that sometimes when you as a child when you go through difficulty like yourself when you were the bullied i mean it it does give you a desire to teach your kids how not to do that and and hopefully i, I can remember in school you know even though i was on the football team and that whole bit there was one girl that just you know she struggled and I just decided, you know, she had a class with me, so I'd find her on the quad before class, and I'd walk her to class with me. And I partly I just wanted to be a, a friend because hmm. I my heart went out to her. She just seemed so lonely. And being the quarterback of the football team, I did think, okay, I can use some of that clout in that way. I didn't get teased. And uh, those are the other good things that you can do as a parent to help, you know, look – for the person who's alone. I remember speaking that to my own boys. When you go to that junior high dance, mm. find somebody who's by themselves that looks uh, fearful and just talk with them. You don't have to dance with them. Oh, okay, I can do that. <laughs> and and, and uh, as you even say that, it's hard for me to not even get emotional because, um, of course, I wished I was the capital, <laughs> captain of a football team. I wished I was that popular. But the power you had and by you taking that power and becoming mm. meek and saying, I'm going to, I'm going to, in essence, you know, go over and walk across the room and say hi to someone. Sometimes it, you have no idea. I mean, honestly, Jim, you have no idea what that does to someone to help them. Because if the captain of the football team would have ever just walked up to me as a guy and said, Hey man, what's your name? And talk to me and stuff. Man, it would it would have boosted me for a week. It it, it raises hi. everybody up, yeah. and I there are some schools that their their sports programs do that really well, and yeah. I applaud them for it. And I hear about those stories. Well, and and that's why I spent a whole chapter talking about positive things that we can do, and giving examples of teachers who had programs where they took. Uh, my sister in law works with special needs kids, and she would take the kids who got detention and were busted, and she would bring them in and make them oh, classroom is... leaders. Yeah, that is and great. And who were helping special needs kids and it was amazing because what she noticed is when she put you know this kind of this rough and tough kid all of a sudden with you know an autistic kid or a kid that was struggling a little bit um it kind of opened their eyes to something they hadn't seen plus they got to by serving they got to see what a difference they can make in someone else's lives yeah. um, another school uh, interviewed they had a program uh, that was kind of a peer mentor program. And what an amazing opportunity to take a kid that was like you, Jim, the studly captain football team, you know, whatever. <laughs> I wouldn't go that like far. <laughs> and partner you with a kid that was like me, that was the kid that wasn't the leader. And it made a world of difference in these kids' lives. Yeah, And it, it, it does, it, there's such spiritual growth in that for both. You know, it, it, there was a benefit for me too. I mean, it made me feel better about who I was as a person. And well, that, think of, I mean, you were being Christ in the fact that you think of Jesus approaching the woman at the well in John chapter 4, just his, just walking up to someone who nobody else even would yeah. walk up to in a town that nobody would even go through. Jesus inviting Zacchaeus yeah. you know, to dinner. Jesus did this all the time. And, and if we're in the Word, hopefully our kids will start to see that and be able to go. Well, and hopefully, hopefully we as parents model that as well. Yeah, but I mean, a 12-year-old can, can do that, a 13-year-old. This is an age-appropriate way. Show yeah. people mm -hmm. that you care and teach it. And that's a good thing. I want to get to the five R's because this kind of uh, accentuates those things. And I want to make sure parents can walk away. Uh, Jonathan, describe what the five R's are. 
I know it's not yeah. arithmetic, writing, and reading, but <laughs> the five R's. The we five sound like R's. a pirate. R. <laughs> yes. What What are the fives? Uh, what are the five R's? Yeah. The five <laughs> R's are. Yeah. No. 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 These These are. You know. I just used a little alliteration here on really how we can help bystanders make an impact. So. So. And, and it really starts with recognizing the effects of bullying, and and so raising that awareness again. Here's where we can use narratives. We can use stories. We can, you know, even those pause moments in a movie, like, hey, what's that kid feel like right now? Yeah. So recognizing, seeing it for what it is. Um, th- there's a chapter in the book that I said, this is the chapter your kid should read, you know, because that helps them recognize it. That's part of the, f- you know, five R's. Um, then realize you can make an impact. Um, let them know some of these studies out there that shows that, hey, one kid can make a difference. Um, because mm-hmm. Honestly, maybe a lot of captains of the football teams don't realize that just by saying hi to someone else, what that does to someone else. So a lot of kids, they don't even know that. And if we could help them understand the power they have to make a difference in someone else's life, um, you know, or, you know and, and I share research and stuff, and there, there might be parts that parents might mark in the book and go, hey, hey, I just read this. What do you think? And share that with your kids so they realize the impact they can make. Um, then it goes on to really the decision making and here's where really, this is probably the most important r and that is resolve to not bully others it's a decision for them to make to go you know what i'm not going to be a part of it i'm not going to be what the bystander name implies and just stand by i am going to stand up and i'm going to say no I'm going to walk away when yes. they start gossiping. I do. And, and that starts with resolving to not bully others and then refusing to join in, you know, not laughing at the jokes. And I think that is the place to concentrate because for the bystander, that's what's so hard at that age because you're looking for your identity. You're looking mm-hmm. to fit in. And if you can teach your elementary school, junior high kids uh, to refuse to join in when people are being hurt emotionally, physically, and to stand up and say, no, not on my watch. But if I could push back a little bit, I think we as parents, sometimes what we do is we jump straight to that. Hey, guys, refuse to join in. And I think without the empathy, they aren't going to understand the why of why they should be doing it. So that's why it's so important for them to recognize those effects and realize that they can make a difference because those are going to give them the emotional ammo to want to actually yeah. mm. resolve to not do it and refuse to join it. Because if you say, just refuse, why? Because I said so, you know, yeah. Yeah, that course, does nothing. Of course, So that's four, recognize, realize, resolve, refuse. What's the fifth R? Um, reach out to someone who's hurting or alone. That's, yeah, that's, that's, not, good. that's not just not doing something, but it's actually saying, hey, you know what? Um, I'm going to go cross the room and go sit by that kid who's sitting by themselves. Jonathan, you also mentioned in your book, and I'm going to squeeze this in, the yeah. 10 tools uh, to help bullied kids. What are a couple of those 10 tools? Yeah, and we, and we, it's neat. We've covered some of them as we've talked about that because the most important thing that it really starts with is not freaking out, you know, and then stepping into their world, the empathy we keep talking about. And, uh, and, and that's where we need to start. I mean, if you honestly got nothing else, mom and dad, get this. Don't fix the problem, but more than anything, ask them, you know, uh, uh, what they're feeling and say, I'm so glad you told me. Jonathan, many dads will hear this and go, yeah, I got it. And then the first thing we're going to do is step in (laughs) because that's, we want to fix it. And you know what? My kid's being bullied. I bow up. You know, I'm even got my chest out right now thinking of being in that environment. My shoulders are back. I mean, physically we respond to that. Like what you said earlier, you ready to go in and take care of your, the bullying of your own child because uh, nobody was helping. It, it is our natural. How, how do we fight that though? Well, what, well, what do we, we do with that energy just, to say, just, I'm going to We have to, we have to tell ourselves to, to stop and be a counselor for a quick second first and say, tell me more about that. How did you feel? Because you So know, act like, opposite of what you want to well, do. Well, let me tell you something. It's like, <laughs> it's like you know, I, like, my, my wife and I went to marriage counseling. It was, it was such a great experience. And one of the things is, as she would tell me something, my tendency was to want to say, well, this or fix or whatever, and to just, no, 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 just listen and say, I hear you. It was amazing how much in in my marriage, how much just saying, wow, I never realized this. I hear you. What you're Mm. saying is this. That made all the difference. I didn't even need to fix it. She just wanted to be heard. Right. And sometimes our kids, they just want to be heard. Well, and that's a great place to start. Jonathan, this has been terrific. I think it's one of the the biggest topics facing kids today in school. Yeah. And we as parents, 
have to be engaged. We've got to know their environment to be able to empathize, like you said. And a great way to start is by reading Jonathan's book, The Bullying Breakthrough. And Jonathan, thank you uh, for being transparent, vulnerable, mm. talking about this. This can't be easy. I mm. mean, I could talk about being the, you know, the quarterback. It's harder <laughs> to say, I got punched and pushed around. No, my I'm pleasure. sorry for that in your life, but you seem mm. to have, through Christ, you've conquered it. And I'm grateful for your example to me. No, no, thanks so much. It's, it's my pleasure and it's fun having this dialogue. Mm. Hey, I'm John Fuller and thanks for watching. Get more info about Focus over here and more from our guests over there. And be sure to subscribe to our channel as well.